when you and I trust in Jesus Christ, our sins are eradicated. Welcome to this presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. It is our desire that you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and will place all of your hope and trust in Him. Please join us as Pastor Jeff Warden II opens the Bible for us today. It's my privilege to stand here before you and try to figure out how this is going to work. I do covet your prayers uh, as I get into this position of ministry that's a, a step above what we have been doing already. Um, I'm here to serve the church and you all. I love you and I enjoy digging into God's word and sharing it with you. That's my desire and I'm thankful that uh, from many years ago God called me to do this as much as it makes me uncomfortable to stand up here I'd rather be in the background digging holes out in slopsicle enjoying that kind of stuff um, I'm here because I feel like God has called me to open the word and share it with you as I enjoy the study and the part of that and hopefully it comes across and you enjoy what I have uh, studied we're going to be talking about prayer once again. Looks like we'll be uh, doing this for quite some time. I don't know how much longer. I've got several more opportunities to share with you what I'm learning. Charles Spurgeon was asked what he thought was more important, uh, reading God's word or prayer. Spurgeon responded, you tell me what's more important, breathing in or breathing out. It's so important for us to understand that God's word and praying God's word go hand in hand. Praying scripture is breathing in and breathing out. The last time we were together, we began looking at definitions and methods of praying the promises of God's word. Pardon me, some of that cracker gets stuck and then it's hard to talk. We see prayer as communication with God. We looked at the perfect communication that was available between Adam and God in the garden. God walked and talked with Adam. When Adam sinned, that open, two-way, honest communication was cut off. Now man hides from God and attempts to approach God in his own manner. Our communication suffers as we try to sound more spiritual. We are less open and honest, and our true selves are actually left out of our prayers. Jesus' sacrifice, which we just celebrated in communion, removed our sin and the barrier that sin brought with it. This allows us to approach God as children approaching their Father. Our communion with God should be seen as a precious time that we desire and God delights to share with us. One time evangelist D.L. Moody's five-year-old son entered his study while he was busy writing. He didn't make a sound. He just sat there quietly until finally Moody said, well, what do you want? His son said, nothing, Daddy. I just wanted to be where you are. This is what our prayer life should look like. Scripture is the foundation of our faith and becomes the foundation of our prayers. When we speak God's word back to him in prayer, we speak his thoughts, his plans, and his will. Our hearts and minds are transformed through these prayers. Our next point shows us that this relationship and communion in prayer is not exclusive. Before we open God's word and look at this point, let's take a moment and ask his blessing. Dearest Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have your word before us, that it's living, that it's active, and it's powerful, that it transforms hearts and lives. We ask that you would open your word to us today, that your spirit would bury it in our hearts, change our lives, and make an effect on us as we go out into our communities this week. Be with us today, calm our nerves, and help your word to be what's expressed here. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. 
Our first point, actually the only one we're going to get to today probably, is that Scripture is available. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Several of these are going to be displayed on the screen. I encourage you to take a look at what's written in your Bibles, the chapter, the book itself. Get an idea that this is exactly what is being said, not taken out of context. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then turn over with me to James chapter 1 and verse 5. James 1, 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask for it from God, the one who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We see here that our position, our title, our upbringing, our history, our intelligence, and our ability is never taken into account by God when he answers our prayers. You see the word all? That's all-inclusive. And the reproach means that God does not look down on us for any request that we make. He simply wants us to come to him and speak to him about our issues. John 15, 7 with me, please. John chapter 15, verse 7. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. The word abide means to remain. We must remain in Christ in every way, in every part of our life. This is a vital union between us and Christ. We are dependent on him for grace and for the ability to obey. We see in his word the instructions that we need to live. We submit to his authority and his leading. When we abide, then Jesus is the source of our life and the reason that we are sustained and continue to grow in likeness toward him. Jesus told uh, the Pharisees that had believed in him, the Jews that had believed in him, he said, a sign of true faith is abiding in his word. John 8, 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. We are called to abide in Christ and his words to abide in us. In order for his words to abide in us, we have to read them. We have to memorize them. We have to meditate on them. This is much more than just a cursory reading of our daily devotional scripture. It means that we have to dig into God's word. Reading is really only the first step. Then reading it out loud is a good second step. Reading it over and over and over. Memorizing it writing it down, asking God, reveal what your word is to me. Help me understand this, praying over it while we're reading it. That is how God really opens his word to it and us, and it abides in us. I think about the word abide, and I picture living in my house. You guys all know that another word for house is abode, right? Abode means a home or a house, a place of habitation or a place of residence. Abode comes from the root word to abide. I've lived in my house for a long time. I built the house. We've arranged most of the furniture. I know where everything is. I can find it without difficulty. I can even walk around in my house in the dark. 
uh, as long as the kids or the dogs haven't put things in my way. When we went to Austin and Laura's wedding, we rented a house in New York so we could all stay in one place. Guess what? I could not find anything in that house. Even turning on the light switches to find things in the dark was difficult because I didn't know where the light switches were either. There was explore exploration was necessary to find the things in that house. I didn't abide there. I wasn't there long enough to even become familiar with it. I couldn't tell you anything about it today if you asked. When we live in God's word, we become much more at home with it. This abiding in God's word increases our understanding of God's will, our understanding of our position, and how to pray. Our desperate cries of prayers are very simple and do not require much scripture to pour out of our mouths. But as we grow in our relationship with God and desire deeper fellowship, we depend more and more on scripture to speak the words of our prayers. From the very beginning of my relationship with God, it was scripture that taught me. Scripture tells me of my sin. Scripture accuses me of rebellion and declares my lost and hopeless condition. Romans chapter 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10 says, it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. It was scripture that teaches me of God's provision of salvation guides me to confess, to repent, and to believe. John 3, 16, do you know it? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How about Romans 6, 23? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Scripture assures me of my forgiveness. It declares me to be righteous and redeemed. John 10, 28, My Father has given, to them, given them to me and is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Romans 6, 18, Having been freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. That is also the Romans road, in case you guys are wondering, how do I use scripture to lead someone to Christ? I'm not sure how to do it. It's all spelled out right there in those verses in Romans. Scripture now moves me from fear to faith, and from despondency to dependency. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Scripture then declares that prayer is not restricted. It's not restricted to special people in special positions, but is available to all. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you. I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Scripture invites us to pray. There is no condition of position. There is no restriction of title. There is no special certain people that God offers to reveal great and mighty things to. He invites everyone to call on him and promises he will answer. Look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to check out a story of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3.
We're going to start in verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time that Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and said to him, Here I am. Sorry, Lord God called Samuel and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered and said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Verse 19 wraps up this story with, Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. From this story, we see God initiating a conversation with a boy. A boy who was sleeping in the temple next to who? Eli the priest. God initiated a conversation with the boy, not with the priest, who held a position of authority. God initiates prayer by extending an invitation for us to communicate with him. If we don't respond, it will remain only an invitation. Do you see Samuel's response? Speak, Lord, for I am listening. It's so important for part of our time in prayer to be spent silently listening to what God says. When Samuel answered God's call to initiate conversation, God revealed his word to Samuel. And verse 19 tells us that his words did not fail. I'm guessing we've all felt the Holy Spirit at some time or another drawing us into prayer. The very first time was when he urged us to confess our sins and repent. He draws us to prayer over situations, over circumstances, over timing, over everything. Our response to this urging brings either great blessings to us when we submit and we see the answer to prayers, or it brings us guilt that we ignored him and missed out. So when we feel this drawing of the Holy Spirit to meet God in prayer, but we don't feel worthy or ready right then, how do we respond to that? Scripture answers that as well. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 20 through 21. Isaiah 26, verses 20 through 21. God's word says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place. When you don't feel like praying, God says, Go to your quiet place and close the door. Shut out the distractions, shut out the things that are on your brain, shut out all of the world. Hide and adjust your attitude is what God is telling them here. 
Sin is going to have my wrath poured out upon it very soon. There is nothing more important than my calling to you to pray while you can. So we take this scripture, we pray it out loud, and we submit to God just like Samuel did. I'm listening. God, speak to me. This verse then opens our hearts, it closes the resistance, and it readies us to pray. And we see that Scripture gives us both the message that we can pray and the motive for our prayers. Scripture assures us that God is interested in more than theology. He's interested in our lives. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. First Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all of your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. I feel like a side trail. At this point, I want to uh, take a little side trail and look at the providence of God, because it's so important for us to truly grasp how much he cares for us. It will affect our prayer life. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Lots of jumping around today. Keeps everybody awake, right? It's keeping me awake. I guess that's a good thing. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 26. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his life's span? Why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory, uh, Solomon in all of his glory, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Jesus in these verses directs us to look at the birds and how God feeds them. And consider the lilies because God clothes them. Jesus is telling his followers to put away anxiety because their heavenly Father will take care of them. Look closer at these verses. Realize Jesus is not telling a parable. He's not making a beautiful analogy. God loves to paint pictures for us. He does it all through Scripture because He knows of our weakness of our minds and the frailty of our human nature. But this is not one of those pictures. Jesus' direction to not be anxious is only valid if God the Father truly is the one who makes sure that the birds find their daily sustenance and close the flowers in their glorious garb. Do you see that this, if, if this is just nature doing what it's supposed to do without divine intervention, then Jesus is only making a play on words. I don't see that here. Jesus truly believes that God's hand is at work in every detail and down to the smallest details in all of the natural processes. It's more apparent in Matthew chapter 10. Take a look there. Thank you for that. Nothing wrong with speaking up. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. 
but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not fear, you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus gets much more in depth here. God doesn't just clothe the lilies and feed the birds. He makes the decision when each and every bird dies. The point is that you are much more precious to God than any bird or flower. You have no need to fear. This kind of fatherly care means that God will take care of you and your every need. We can seek the kingdom of God first with abandon because we know that there are no other cares or worries that we have. We see God being completely hands-on with nature and we realize that he will be much more involved with us, his children. Some see the world as a giant mechanism that God has just wound up and left to run on its own. We are simply cogs in this impersonal mechanism as it runs out its course. Those people have good reason to be anxious and worry about what will happen next. Our God is hands-on. I heard a Christian song this week. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good one. They were trying to bring attention to the fact that our help is coming from God. And they used the verse about, look to the hills, that's where my help is coming from. Unfortunately, they used the phrase, he's rolling up his sleeves, to picture, okay, God's ready to get down and dirty and into the mess and help us out. And the problem with that is that it seems like God is just kind of standing by and watching while everything runs its course, and then he realizes that, oh man, they've really made a mess, and now I've got to get involved again. That is not the God that I serve. That is not the God that's revealed in his word. He reveals a masterful painting that he himself has envisioned and is carrying out brush stroke by brush stroke. And Jesus is the one who's holding the whole masterpiece together by the power of his word. That's Colossians 1.17. Think for a minute about the amazing sunrises or sunsets that God paints on a daily basis. I've seen some of the pictures posted in the social media. It's amazing the beauty that's expressed in a simple sunset or a sunrise for those of you that are up early enough with me to see them. Now think beyond yourself. Realize that that sunrise or sunset is happening somewhere in the world all the time. 24 hours a day and God never stops guiding the sun. 24 hours a day, sunrise and sunset he never grows weary of displaying its beauty or the work of making that beauty available for all of mankind to see. This should help us revel in our positions as God's children, knowing that God cares for us and provides for us and tells us not to be anxious. When we approach God in humility, according to the scripture, there is nothing about our lives that we cannot discuss with him in prayer. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. What an amazing way to approach prayer. I'm coming to God as the one that cares for me. If that doesn't affect the way that you pray, I don't know what will. Turn with me to Luke. Sorry, I'm looking at Romans. You can go to Luke, but you'll be lost. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. 
verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an amazing invitation to pray. This covers past, present, and future. It affects the divine, the human, and the demonic realms. Every need in every situation, in every realm, in every time period can be brought to God in prayer. Does anybody remember seeing the prayer requests on April 20th from the Rots in Costa Rica? They were experiencing some of the heaviest rains and flooding in many years. There's a river that runs next to the ministry center, which is also their home, and it was causing damage as it continued to rise. They requested prayer for divine intervention. I'm sure that many prayers went up at that very moment. Do you remember seeing the answer to prayers? Anybody remember seeing it? The weather forecast that morning was a 100% chance of rain, which is not odd because it's the rainy season in the tropics. That's what it does. Guess how much rain they got? None. 100% chance of rain, and there was no rain all day. We prayed about rain, and God cared about a couple of people in a third world country that were doing their work to glorify him. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. There's a word of caution here, though. Do, do not mistake your dwelling in anxiety and worry for prayer. Judson Cornwall gives an example in his book on prayer. He said, a young husband came for counsel, seeking healing regarding his troubled marriage. I asked him, have you tried praying about this? He responded, I've prayed about it day and night for over a week. I asked if we could blend our faith and our prayer together right there and got on my knees beside him. He followed my example, but silence descended on the room like a thick fog. To break the silence, I offered a prayer on his behalf, but he didn't even say amen. Silence again reigned, so I prompted him, you lead us out in prayer. He, res he responded, I can't pray. He was so distraught that he couldn't speak, no matter how I coached or urged him. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Brother, you haven't been praying about this problem day and night for over a week or you wouldn't have trouble expressing your need to prayer in prayer to God right here in my study. You've been worrying and thinking about your problem consistently and that isn't prayer. Judson says he opened the Psalms and had him read aloud. Hear, O Lord, my righteous pleas. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. May my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. That's Psalm chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. He said he was able to slowly move from reading to prayer. He put his anxiety into words and great release followed. It was praying the scriptures that gave him those words to speak, even in his darkest, deepest dungeon. There is no condition attached to the invitation to pray. No provision, no title, no need for sacrifice or propitiation from us. God is simply saying, come and talk it over with me. 
We're invited to come empty-handed and unload all of our cares on him. Scripture does teach us to incorporate thanksgiving with our prayer. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul had learned that dealing with our fears and anxieties by themselves can bring discouragement and depression. When we bring all of our anxiety, our fears, and our causes for worry to God, we also remember his previous provision, his promises, his nature, and we give thanks for those. There are formal dinner invitations that include the phrase, black tie required. I've never been to one of those. I'm just told that they exist. This phrase, black tie required, lets the guests know that there is a dress code. You'll feel out of place and ashamed instead of rejoicing and communing properly if you come to prayer without thanksgiving and ignore that request, similar to those who show up at the event and ignore the request for the dress code. Don't ignore the request to bring your request to God with thanksgiving. Turn with me, final verse, Psalm 34. We will close with this, Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Ray Pritchard said, When you forget God's goodness, it's easy to become critical and judgmental of others. Your bitterness will kill your appetite for his sweetness, or his sweetness will dispel your bitterness. This week, practice praying God's word. Bring all of your anxiety to him and lay them at his feet. Remember that God wants to talk to us about every aspect of our lives because he cares for us more deeply than you can even imagine. He delights in the sacrifice because he has chosen us. Remember also to include thanksgiving with our requests because we have already tasted and seen that God is good. Dear Lord, thank you for how you have revealed yourself to us, how you have shown us your goodness, how you have shown us your care for us, how you delight to have our company and our communion with you. Help us to take this to heart and this week come to you in prayer with a renewed sense of communion, with a renewed sense that you delight in our presence. Let us come to prayer not just with our requests but with thanksgiving because of who you are, what you have done, and how you have provided for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.